And I'm wondering, like, given that and what you've, the experience that you've had in group therapy and group sessions, like, why does it work? Or how have you seen it work? Well, I'll start, I guess. Um, I am glad you brought it up. I think group therapy is totally underutilized in the general pop substance use or not. Um, it's such, it's, it's a great resource because you're not just getting insight from a professional. I mean, there's support groups, but then there's group therapy that, that a professional moderates and you're getting insight from the professional, but you're also getting insight from peers and the professional seeing you in the field, in the social world. So it takes someone with social anxiety to be able to be there and be anxious and talk about it and work through it in, in the real scene where it's happening. It, it's so much more valuable than being one-on-one -on -one, where you may be very comfortable with your therapist, but maybe you're not comfortable around the opposite gender, whatever the issue is. So I think, I think I've taken so many lessons from working in the treatment world because group therapy is so important. You know, I think, one of the things that I learned in my psychoanalytic psychotherapy training was like that you don't self-disclose in boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. But then in the substance use world, if you don't self-disclose a little bit, they're not going to trust you and there's going to be no connection. So like I, I oftentimes have to share a little bit. Okay. Like I was in a relationship with an alcoholic. Oh, now like the guard comes down. Oh, now I can talk about what's going on with my husband or whatever. You know, so sometimes those tools that come up in a group setting because we're all sharing and we're all more comfortable sharing or someone out, maybe the practitioner is not, but maybe someone else is, really helps people let their guard down. The other thing I wanna say about group therapy is it's more affordable. Um, these days we're all disconnected from each other. And so to be able to be social in a way especially you know people with anxiety and depression are oftentimes not socializing so it creates a social interaction built into your schedule um it's just more it's more accessible more affordable and underutilized and i and i think that there's so much value in it um that people should just be using it more and we, we can take that lesson from the substance use world because it's a critical part of that care yeah, and I think it's now that yeah, I'm, I'm listening to you, it's interesting because the entry points to the question was because it is so utilized in the treatment world and the substance abuse world that, that that's sort of like where my training at least came in, in facilitating groups and looking at, at the dynamics within the groups. So yeah, um, Chaim, what do you think? Well, it's interesting. I actually, now that I think about it, it, this really just occurred to me as you were talking and, and I'm not sure if it's accurate or not. But it is interesting that one of the ways I think why it's so potent in the substance uh, use world is, you know, it's like, what are people triggered by, right? It's like people, places, and things. We create these associations, right? Our networks often, the system for someone who's struggling with addiction is often a system that is enabling or supportive of or, or fostering their addictive behavior. Whereas by entering a group, of people who are also working on, you know, resolving their addiction issues or their substance use issues, you're now changing your context to be a context that is supportive of recovery rather than a context that is supportive of substance use. And that's like a key piece of the puzzle for, for those people is, right, is, is all about changing the context, right? We know that it's like, if you keep doing the same things that you were doing and you just try to do that while stopping drinking, it usually doesn't work, right? It's like, it's, it's so many of the, the moving parts in our life have to change in order to actually um, to, to scaffold and support the recovery process. Um, the other thing, Zach, and you and I talk about this a lot in the support group we run, is the power of group therapy is like, there is something incredibly healing in discovering that you're not alone in your experience. And I think people who suffer, whether that's depression or anxiety or, you know, OCD or an eating disorder or whatever it might be, uh, people who struggle in their mental health often have this incredible sense of aloneness in what they're going through. And, you know, it's like my demons are inside of me kind of thing. And I've certainly felt uh, that at the times that I've struggled in my life. And by showing up in a room where it's not just a therapist listening to you, but, you know, you've got eight other people who are like, oh, I'm actually in the exact same place you're in right now, struggling with this too. Uh, it just, that takes away that extra suffering that comes through feeling like maybe we're going through our, our pain alone, you know? Totally. And I was just like, totally. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, and I, I think practically speaking too, like you said, Stacey, it can be less expensive to, for someone to get help, um, in a group setting, either a support group or a group therapy and something that we do at backline and that we really, you know, our, our focus towards is through the, the support group offerings for free. And I know Stacy, at the moment you are offering and will continue to offer various, uh, group sessions and group therapy sessions for a lot of different things that people are going through. So I think it's, it's important again to, to, to state that this is, could be an entry point into somebody that is uh, just, you know, not one-on-one -on -one and not super expensive and can be less, less threatening in a lot. Of yeah. I was just thinking, you know, it's like when you're in the therapy room in individual therapy, it's like the whole spot, you're the only one talking yeah. all the focus which can be intense and here you can kind of come sit and listen most of the time. And yeah, I like that you were saying, that's a cool point, Zach. It's like disarming a little because you've just heard someone else be vulnerable. So maybe it's a little easier for you. Well, you, could, you know, uh, seeing somebody else allows, or gives one permission to start talking. And I, I sort of going back to what I said about the, when somebody else discloses and it's not met with, <gasps> what's wrong with you? And it's met with, no, me too. It, it invites anybody else to start sharing as well. So, yeah. I think people get tips and tricks and even advice about individual practitioners by listening to the other group members. I also think there's a biological benefit and dopamine rush from socialization that that's different when you're, than when you're one-on-one. -on -one. So there's, there's so much to it that's useful and fruitful, whether in the substance use realm or not. Um, so we can take a lesson from there for sure.